Hi everybody and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Mindful Constitution podcast. I'm here today with Pat Dueling of Dre Drinks which is super exciting because if you're unfamiliar, it is a NA bottle shop in Boston in the South End, and it is the first and only NA bottle shop in Boston, which is super exciting. And so I twisted his arm and forced him to come on the podcast to dive in with me about his inspiration, his own sober curious story. Uh, how it's going, being kind of the pioneer of this movement in Boston. And so I'm really excited for him to share his story and vision and experience with us. And so welcome, Pat. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me. Here. Great to be on yeah. here. I appreciate the invite. You did not have to twist my arm hard. I, I love, <laughs> to, uh, love to talk about all things Dre and, and uh, you know, the industry and stuff. So it's great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So exciting. So cool to see this. I've definitely been obviously like following the the movement of NA bottle shops kind of popping up everywhere. And so I've seen them in a lot of different cities. And so when I saw Dre, I was super excited that it was local and I would be able to like visit in person and everything. So yes, So yeah, okay, let's get into it here because I have a bunch of questions for you. And I wanted to just start by kind of talking about what, outside of the business, just what ignited your sober, sober curious path and decision to give up alcohol. Yeah, no, and and I think it's all related because I think, um, I don't think I'd be doing Dre without um, kind of a personal interest in it. it. It's a, it's a great business project, which we can talk about that side of it. But I think the the personal side of it probably was more the initial uh, crux. Um, And so I quit drinking a little over two years ago now. So um, I'm a completely sober guy. So it's no, no drinking and, um, you know, nothing else. Um, And it's been, uh, it's been a great journey for me. I mean, I think, you know, we could rewind a long, long time, but I think I, I'm somebody who, um, I don't know if I was ever a normal drinker, I guess I would say, is probably a classic way to say it, is just sort of always having a sense that um, it wasn't great for me, but I was sort of always a willing participant, you know, and I think it sort of speaks to the heart of some of the stuff with Dre, but I think my feeling was, you know, growing up was just alcohol was a really normal part of life. It was a highly normalized activity It was absolutely everywhere. Um, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, so middle of the country. It's almost, it's it's one of its big claims to fame is it's the home of Anheuser-Busch, which is, um, or AB InBev or whatever version of it it's called now, which is, uh, you know, obviously one of the world's largest beer companies and one of the world's largest sellers of of alcohol that um, literally was was literally in my backyard. I mean, it was, was, you know, miles away from where I grew up and, and, uh, very much infused in the culture of that city. Um, and so I say that not to be critical in any way, but just to kind of give a flavor of how how deeply ingrained, um, you know, my understanding of drinking was was from a very early age. And so obviously, you know, when I became of age, participated in that. Um, and then, you know, I think over time, like, I, I just felt like, you know, it wasn't, um, it was something that was too much a part of my life at different stages and, and was, was clouding parts of my life. It was exacerbating all sorts of, you know, anxiety and depression and stuff I dealt with. And so I think for a lot of different reasons, you know, decided that, you know, I really needed to kind of fully quit, um, back Mm -hmm. in 2021. I think, you know, I, we could go through all the stories of the pandemic, but I'm, I'm certainly probably one of the people who, um, one of the great things about the pandemic for me, uh, you know, to, to, to see the silver lining was um, kind of the ability to see how, you know, alcohol was affecting me negatively and, and making the decision to quit then. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it was a would you say crazy time for all of us, but, you know, for me, it was crazy time plus a lot of great learning towards towards the end there. 
Right. Yeah. So you feel like that kind of clarity of the pandemic or moment to pause and reflect gave you this opportunity to explore your drinking a little more intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I think the pandemic obviously did a lot of different things, but to me, one of the things it did was just put a put a microscope on any, any habit you had, good or bad. Um, it really just, there was so much, I think, uh, you know, isolation, so much sort of time spent, you know, just in and of yourself. And, and so I, I think for me, the pandemic was a lot of like the staring inward. And, you know, if you had good stuff that, that probably came out, but if you had bad stuff, it probably, you know, got exacerbated. And so, mm-hmm. I think it gave me a lot of clarity to say that, you know, that was, that was the right time, you know, to be, to be done. And and it was, you know, it was a great moment in my life as well. I was turning 40, um, roughly at that, around that time. Um, so I quit drinking right before I turned 40. Um, you know, it's a momentous time in life. I had two young children and, um, you know, a life that in many ways was, uh, fantastic and that, you know, I wanted to continue and wanted to, see for many, many years going forward. And and to me, it became clear that, you know, with alcohol involved, it was just, you know, it was less clear what the quality of that life would be and, and, you know, how long it would be ultimately too. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's so, uh, you know, as parents, it's really an opportunity to reflect on our drinking and what example yeah. we want to normalize for our kids. And it really puts a whole different lens on, our choice to drink or not drink. And it, even in partnership too, when you mentioned like your wife is really supportive, like how did yeah. that unfold when you were deciding, was it like this thing that you talk came to her and you're like, uh, I think that I might want to stop drinking. Like how did it unfold within your partnership? Cause I think that's something a lot of people are curious about when one person decides to stop drinking in a serious relationship and the, like whether the other person does or doesn't and you know how the communication goes with that. So what did that look like for you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great topic. I mean, I think I've been really fortunate in that, you know, my wife and I have had a great partnership in a lot of different things. And I think that um, the sort of foundation of that is, you know, just a lot of, you know, shared values, beliefs, goals, all sorts of stuff we want to want to do in life and and, and live. And, and obviously, part of that comes around raising children and things like that. So it's, you kind of coalesce around values and that type of thing then. But I think the supportiveness is, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, anytime you're making a change, and, and I think people learn this in recovery and, and sobriety in general, like, making a change inherently, uh, you need, you need group, you need connection, you need people around you supporting you in different ways. Um, and so that starts really right at home, right? I mean, it starts with people, you know, who see you and live with you day to day. And I think my wife was never somebody who, you know, drank all that much and, and wasn't probably as, as culturally and, you know, socially deep in, in, uh, you know, alcohol or anything else. Um, and so I think for her, it wasn't, um, it's not something she held dearly, right? And and so I think what was tremendous for me was just, I decided to quit drinking, you know, for her, that was, you know, I, I think a relatively easy decision to just say, yeah, I'm, I don't need to do that either and, and sort of support kind of every step of the way that, um, you know, whether it was like my intense personal work I was doing around um, sobriety and stuff, or whether it was just the simple act of just, you know, her not drinking as much or, or at all, you know, really. Um, And, um, and then I think over time that built a lot into, um, built a lot into, you know, the, the business too, which we can ultimately get to, but, but there was a lot of the foundation of, you know, my kind of going through some sobriety and sort of deep personal work and stuff like that, that, um, you know, she partnered along the way. And, and I think was always a constant reminder of like, Hey, the stuff you're thinking about and talking about and doing, you know, this, this all could and should become bigger, you know, there's, there's a lot more out there. Um, Cause I think one of the things I, I think one of the challenges I felt like I had early on with the sobriety stuff was just not feeling like I could get my arms around like a traditional path to, you know, quitting, if you will. Um, it, it's like, I didn't know what to call exactly what I wanted to do. I, I need, you know, I needed to quit and stop. I mean, that was clear to me, but, you know, even trying some of the sort of traditional methods around, 
you know, sobriety or recovery weren't, uh, didn't work that great for me candidly. And I didn't feel like I had, and, and I would say that combined with the fact that I had never felt like I experienced, like, I never really experienced people, you know, making that choice. Like everybody around me kind of, you know, seemed like may, maybe they had, you know, quit at different points of time, but, but I didn't know it and nobody was vocal about what they were doing. And, and, um, and so I found it like, you know, and I'm somebody who, I got a lot of resources. I have a pretty good life. I have great healthcare. I've got great people around me. Um, I had like, if you're going to make a choice to quit or make a change, I probably had it about as good as anybody could, could want it. Um, Mm -hmm. And I still found it hard. I still found it challenging to figure out the path to kind of, you know, support my decision and and live that out um, early on. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of infused in that is the sort of genesis of where, some of the ideas behind Dre have, have come from, but, um, but certainly, you know, it starts at home with, with your partner. And, you know, I think if, if you don't have support, you know, out of the gate at, at home, I mean, I don't know how anybody would, would navigate, you know, a choice like that. Um, so it's been, mm-hmm. it's been hugely valuable. She's been a great support and, and, you know, tool and resource for me. Yeah, that's so beautiful to hear. And I think it's so cool to hear stories of relationships where, you know, one person finds that sobriety or eliminating alcohol is the choice for them. And the other partner maybe isn't on the exact same path, but to be able to find that like support within each other and supporting, you know, your version of your best self, even if it's like slightly different than hers is is so cool. And um, you mentioned that, you didn't really find like an existing approach that resonated with you. And so are you kind of talking about like AA or feeling like you didn't really know where you fit in, in terms of your path to recovery? Do you mind sharing a little more about like what, what kind of didn't resonate, what did, or what you felt like was missing for you personally? Yeah, I guess I would say I was trying to think of the right overall frame of it. Cause I, I don't, uh, I, you know, I never like to badmouth any groups or tools that people use because I think it's such a personal journey, but you know, that that's part of it. But I guess what I would say is overall, it sort of felt to me early on, like, you know, there's this very sort of stark black and white with drinking or like sobriety recovery. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like you're on one side or the other, you know, you're, you're, you're out in your social and you're participating or, you're going to closed door meetings that nobody wants to talk about. And, and, you know, you're, you're, you're different now. And, and I think that to me never felt like great. And, you know, it never felt like kind of the sort of balance of just being integrated into, you know, normal life as somebody who makes the choice to not drink, you know, it just sort of like, it, it didn't, it didn't ever feel like it ought to be that black and white. It ought to get that stark. It ought to be, you know, you can only go certain places, talk to certain people and this, you know, it, it just felt like there's a lot of strict lines um, around some things. And I think that combined with also just my finding was just, there weren't, um, I think there wasn't, there's there's not a sort of broad understanding of all the tools out there, I think, to support, you know, people's choices around, well, you know, sobriety, recovery, whatever form of it you want to call it. But I think there was kind of like, I found that there were sort of limited avenues that I could see and understand right away of like, okay, you could, you know, you could go to this meeting or you could go, you know, do whatever, but it was like a very small subset of things that over time I've just found is, is really limited. And there's just so much more out there, um, whether they be groups or people or types of therapy that, you know, I never knew about, or, um, you know, I, I think personally the, what we do at Dre is a, is a tool as well in terms of, you know, fitting, pe- fitting in and, you know, including people in, in things like basic, you know, food and beverage and, you know, going out and that type of thing. So they're, they're all different tools, but, um, I guess I didn't have a lot of great visibility into all that earlier on. And so it took me a while to just sort of find my footing of like, okay, what's the right balance of stuff that Mm -hmm. I want to do to kind of support my choices and and what felt healthy from a mental health standpoint, from a physical health standpoint. Um, And ultimately, I think to me, I, 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 the biggest thing to me was that it, you know, I felt like it was a very profound choice to just quit drinking. And I felt like for me, the choice was like, I, you know, I cut this out entirely. And 
and it just it just affected so many aspects of my life that I felt needed work. And, you know, again, that's, that's physical health, that's mental health, that's, you know, just this relationships, you name it, it was sort of a very broad based mm -hmm. decision. And, and in doing that, it's just like, I felt like I needed to think through a lot of different aspects and tools and things. It wasn't just like a one time choice. It was like, how do I sort of build a set of um, yeah. tools around my kind of ongoing, you know, betterment and health. And so, right. um, yeah, there's a lot of, um, I'd say early on, I call it like fumbling around in the dark and then, you know, kind of trying to find my path and, and um, you know, feeling like I got, I got a lot of learning out of that, which I'm hoping to infuse in, in Dre. Yeah. Yeah. You're highlighting so many things that like really speak to me and my own process too. And definitely like this more holistic approach to a alcohol-free life and a sober yeah. life and just really acknowledging that like, removing the substance of choice requires like so much more than the removal of it. It requires yep. addressing all of the aspects of our life that like kept us seeking something to escape it. And what you mentioned about AA, I feel like exactly the same where I think we're in a time where it we're realizing like things aren't all as black and white as we make them out to be. Yep. And we don't need to label people. People are very complex individuals and nuanced individuals and while AA and the like kind of structure of that and can be really helpful for what I think is people like further along the spectrum of addiction as more and more people are deciding like drinking might not be for me but maybe I'm not like in a full-blown like addictive ad uh, state of addiction I'm kind of deciding to step away from it maybe that like particular environment doesn't feel like it resonates as much and and it can be like various truths existing at once that yeah. like that approach can work for many many people but it can also be true that it may turn some people away who are willing to explore their relationship with alcohol well before becoming an alcoholic and so yeah. that's why I love sober curiosity because it's like it doesn't have to be this, like, you need to come here, label yourself, and, like, this is what you need to do in order to, like, recover. It can be, hey, like, anyone could become addicted to alcohol given the right, like, set of circumstances. And, like, sure. you might want to take a peek at your drinking if you feel stuck in your life, if you feel unhappy, if you feel like you're not reaching your full potential. And there's an element of empowerment that comes along with it that's, like, just a little like different sometimes and I think the culture of AA can feel like a little like you said I think stark yeah. is the word and so just creating more spaces for people to explore and like whatever works for you I think it, my mom did AA for years and um she's sober now and she like loves AA and it was great for her but even now she doesn't go anymore and she's open about it too because yeah, I realize yeah. that it's anonymous but um yeah. yeah so it's like it works for a lot of people for a lifetime for some people for part of a lifetime and then they work on their own path holistically or some people it just doesn't resonate because they're feeling like well maybe I, this isn't the perfect path for me and so I think it's really cool to draw awareness to that without like any path being wrong yeah absolutely Okay, so now tell me about Dre and tell me about everything that went into like cr the creation of Dre and um, building it because you just opened in November, right? Yeah, just opened in um, late November. Um, so we've been open a couple months. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think the part we talked about first was was the important piece to set the foundation. I, again, I don't think I'd be working on, you know, I would have never had the idea or, or the concept around Dre had I not sort of explored my own kind of personal journey first. And um, I spent probably about a year um, prior to opening working on Dre. So I'd been in the works for some time. And I think, you know, essentially I'm, I'm sort of a general business guy by trade it is maybe the lack of a better term. I have my MBA and, and I uh, have done a bunch of investment work and stuff like that. I've never been in retail specifically. So there's no particular draw to like being a retail person. Um, but I think what I found was like, 
you know, around the time when I, uh, you know, I sort of found sobriety and, and did, did my own work around that was, um, I think it was, you know, it's, it, it is its own moment to sort of look up and explore kind of everything in your life. And I, I think what I was finding was this sort of interest in doing something that was a little bit more related to all that sort of journey and work um, that I've been doing. So it was something, something that where I could sort of integrate my work life a little more closely into a lot of the personal stuff I had a passion about. Um, I was also, you know, 40 and, you know, you start looking around going like, shit, what am I going to do for the next, <laughs> you know, hopefully 40 <laughs> years? And, um, and am I, am I going to love it? And is it going to have impact? And am I going to, you know, am I, am I going to have my children see me do something that's meaningful in the world? And so I think all that kind of bubbled up and then over a year plus, I sort of spent different ways exploring this idea of trying to kind of, you know, integrate some of the concepts. So it was a little bit of like the breaking down the black and white wall, you know, of this, this sort of idea that there's a real spectrum out there of people making choices around, around drinking or not. It's, it's much more of a spectrum, sober, sober, curious, you know, the whole thing. Um, and how could I sort of take and take some of the interesting learnings within the sobriety world and start to pull them out, um, into, into a real business idea. And so I explored a lot of different avenues. And I think one of the things that kept per, uh, uh, percolating up for me was this, um, this idea of, you know, products and, um, you know, the idea that every time you're out of social gathering, every time you're at dinner, um, it's all an opportunity where people are making choices around drinking or not. And, and, you know, oftentimes alcohol is the, the de facto choice in a lot of circumstances and locations. And, and, you know, as I was starting to get into some of those gatherings myself and, you know, find myself in a situation where the choice was, you know, uh, you know, alcoholic drink or a Diet Coke or, uh, you know, an alcoholic drink or some fruit juice and seltzer and, you know, finding, you know, while there were these emerging products, there was still this lack of access to high quality alternatives for people that wanted to, that wanted to still celebrate, that wanted to still have fun and kind of be included um, and so I, mm -hmm. I spent a bunch of time researching and just felt to me like there were, there was such an opportunity to sort of bring these great products out into the light, um, give them a place to shine, um, and have it be, um, just such an easy and simple entree for me, honestly, into making an impact on, on people's lives and people's choice to, to consume less. It's like, I, I still say it today. It's like every, every single time somebody walks in my store. Um, they're looking to make a change. It, it just are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, people don't really find themselves in there just by accident. And and then every time they make a choice to buy a drink there versus an alcoholic drink, that's a positive impact we're making. And so, yeah, um, it really just felt like such a yeah, almost like that's, in my face obvious way to do something. So quickly. true. Yeah. And you highlighted two separate things yeah. within your answer that I wanted to touch upon. Sure. And Ooh, sorry. I think I cut you off a little. We broke no, up no, a little good. bit. You're all set. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, with what you had mentioned, there was two things that really stood out to me, which is just that the element of physical health and spiritual health within sobriety or within the decision to go alcohol free and just mentioning that, you know, there's only soda or options of that nature for people to drink and realizing like a lot of people aren't drinking for health reasons or because they want optimal health. And so they probably yeah. don't want a soda or perhaps they realize that making healthy choices is going to support their sobriety. And so they also don't want a soda or even what you said about, you know, the, uh, the idea of like finding passion and purpose, I feel like that's such an important element of sustainable sobriety because I think so many of us just as a culture drink because of like not being spiritually uh, fulfilled in our lives and maybe having jobs that we're not super enthusiastic about and we come home every day and we just have to decompress when on all reality, if we asked ourselves like, what would truly make me happy? a large portion of the population might not even know because of how we normalize, um, you know, work is work rather than like what's truly going to keep my soul fed and make me feel like I'm 
making the world a better place. I'm really feeling passionate every day. And I think that's something that certainly kept me drinking dysfunctionally on a regular basis was not feeling connected to any passion or purpose in my life and kind of drinking to fill that void. So it sounds like that was a big part of the inner work that you did in sobriety. Yeah, I, I think it, I mean, as you were talking, I mean, it connects a lot to, you know, something I talk a lot about, you know, is is this idea of sort of intentionality around the choices, you know, we make. And it's, um, I joke, because I feel like the word like intentional is almost like a buzzword, you know, within generations younger than me, but it's, it's, it's actually one of the ones I like a lot. Um, and I think in the context of alcohol, there's a lot of, there's a lot of lack of intentional choice that that has has gone on that you know continues to go on where it's just sort of like it's not that people are like actively like well i'm unhappy because i'm going to drink or you know and i'm going to drink or or uh you know i there's some there's not some active mental capacity thing going on where you're like ah, i'm going to pick up this drink there's just it's just a it's just a like that's the de facto it's like well it's there and it kind of makes me feel good and I don't see a better alternative and everybody else is. So, you know, right. and, and that leads to that choice. And I think the intentional choice that I like to think is, is really emerging pretty powerfully today is, is the combination of, you know, there's health science and data. I think that is just way more honest now. And, you know, whether it's like it's podcasts or other, avenues that I think are particularly interesting that are bringing out this idea that, you know, one drink is bad. Like it, it, it's like, we don't need to judge people, but I do think we need to have the basic health science, right? That there's not a healthy level of drinking. It, it, there just isn't. Right. And I think when people have that honest message in their head on the one hand, and then they are offered up an, an alternative, a choice, right? And and so something that Drake could provide, right? If you have an equally attractive non-alcoholic beverage, um, then you have this opportunity to sort of say, gosh, you know, I don't like the health impacts. Um, I see something else that's attractive that I could have. And then obviously coupled with the idea that hopefully the community builds around that. And oh, oh, by the way, other people are doing this too. That just that just allows you to just sort of mm -hmm. say, hey, maybe maybe there is a night where I want to have a drink, but I'm going into it eyes wide open and I know exactly why I'm doing it versus most of the time you're going to say, no, I, I don't want that. It's not that's not the health choice I want to make. That's not the social choice I want to make. Exactly. It's just the idea of informed consent and being aware that if you want to drink, drink, but also yeah. knowing that it probably will affect your mental health, gut health, yeah. um, overall physical health, but also, yeah, emotional health and regulation yeah. and stress resilience and spiritual connection and all of these things that um, we talk a lot about, like the health, physical health implications. But I always like to highlight those like more subtle effects that alcohol has on our yeah confidence and low grade anxiety and depression that we kind of excuse and get used to and just normalize. And I think of how low my self-confidence was when I was drinking, how little I trusted myself and how often I had, you know, residual anxiety from drinking, which was just kind of my mental baseline. And so I feel like opening conversations like this allows people to realize too that even as a normal drinker, alcohol can really be prohibiting you from living your best life. And if you feel like your life isn't exactly where you want it to be, it doesn't have to be in shambles. It can be just not simply like where you dream of being and exploring your relationship with alcohol is really powerful tool that you don't have to ignore until it's like a glaring problem. Yeah. So, yeah. So cool. I, I think it's awesome. All of that, what you're saying and doing. And so, okay. So we got through the creation of Dre and I wanted to ask, cause I feel like I remember something you said about in a post I might be making this up, but I felt like it kind of insinuated that there was pushback around the opening of Dre, or maybe people weren't understanding <laughs> yeah. your 
business model. And so I'm curious, like, did you face pushback when you were trying to open Dre? And if so, how did you handle that? Because I know explaining an NA bottle shop to people outside of the realm of sober curiosity or sobriety might be a little bit like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I no, you, you, de- you definitely read that right. I mean, I, I talk about it at different points in time. But I mean, I think, um, you know, we are uh, the first shop of its kind in, in Boston, um, you know, in, in Massachusetts, and um, in the first, you know, dedicated non alcoholic concept. So traditionally, obviously, it's not that these products didn't exist. But maybe they were sold as a kind of afterthought in a regular liquor store or, you know, in your grocery store and, and, you know, in dry January, all of a sudden people carry them and things like that. Um, but it was kind of thought of as this like, um, small niche, unimportant, ignored, you use all the terms you want kind of category. Um, and so, you know, when, whenever, you know, people see and understand the category that way and you go and tell them, well, I actually want to, that's what I want to do is the whole store. Um, people, you know, people have a, a, an adverse reaction to it and some people still do. I mean, we still get plenty of, you know, typical negative social media comments and stuff. They're like, aren't, aren't you, isn't this just juice? Isn't it, you know, like you got a whole store full of juice and, you know, let's ignore the fact that plenty of places sell juice and do it fine as a business, but that aside, yeah. um, I, I think there's a lot of people who did not understand the quality of the products. I think there's people who didn't understand the demand that's out there. I mean, I think unless you immerse yourself in this world, now obviously you do and, and I have, but I think other people standing outside of it might not understand the sort of tidal wave of change that's been occurring with younger generations drinking less and people just making these more mindful choices. So, you know, and I was looking at the model, this the, the non-alcoholic store model exist in other markets. And and so this isn't a, you know, totally brand new category, but it was new for Boston, uh, which is a pretty big city to not have one um, to start. And so I would go around. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I looked at 80 different retail storefronts to try to open this business. And I had doors closed in my face on, you know, I don't know, two thirds of those um, with landlords who just laughed at the idea that, you know, I was going to make a sustainable business out of this. And, and so um, you know, I think any, that, that happens with anything that's new, anything that's unproven. And, and, and so the good news is we're over that hump. So I, I, I'm not worried about it anymore. But, you know, we, we always face some amount of pushback. And, and um, I think uh, we just, you know, we continue to sort of prove people wrong every day. I, I like I prefer proving people wrong at the product level, frankly, though, I love to have people come in our store and tell us that they don't think they can ever find a great non alcoholic red wine. And, you know, I'm, I'm drinking one tonight, of course, um, right. you know, that, you know, when I get those kind of people who come in, buy a bottle and I see them a week later and they're just like, you know, okay, what else do you got for me? I mean, that, that's a, a tremendous victory yeah. and, and a lot of fun. So. Yeah, it's so cool. It is probably such a good feeling for you to <laughs> within a few months of opening being featured on the news and all this stuff. And you're like, Hey, yeah. do you regret not renting yeah. to me yet? Yeah. Your, your yeah. face could have been on Nessun or whatever, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's like the <laughs> high, high school ex-girlfriend or something like that. But yes. Um, yeah. yeah, it is. It, it is nice. I, I, I think it's great for the industry overall. And I think it's just great to it just proves there's something here. And I, I think hopefully others will follow and, and, you know, particularly other places like bars and restaurants and places where, you know, they can have, you know, they don't have to have a whole business model centered around non-alcoholic, you know, they can make small changes that um, help with inclusivity and, you know, help people make healthier choices. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you know, pioneering that on a larger scale, but then the more people are exposed to that. And it is interesting, even the, I totally know what you're talking about, because even with sober curiosity, I mean, when I first started, I started hearing about it in the health and wellness sphere. Like when I stopped drinking, I did not know what sober curiosity was. I just knew Mm -hmm. that like drinking was no longer working for me. And I needed to take a break to like figure out what I wanted to do with my own career and health and wellness. And I also just, I just intuitively felt like I need a break from this, like just to figure out what I want out of life really. And 
then through not drinking and slowly saturating my reality with things, I started to realize like, oh, sober curiosity, like this is a thing. What is this thing? And I read like Ruby Warrington's book and um, started getting into like the naked mind and all of those books, um, alcohol explained, you know, every quit lit book and realizing, wow, this is a really big thing. And it really speaks to what you were saying about having surrounding yourself with supportive community, because it really does change your whole perspective, not only on like what's normalized, but what's possible for you and what reality you can create. And it really allows you to have a mindset to succeed. I completely feel that after I started building community around sober curiosity and just sharing, you know, your own story and building around the best version of yourself, you start to attract new and different people too. And it's wild when your reality starts reflecting the new choices you're making, how supportive it is and how like much it continues to accelerate and propel your growth and evolution. And then you reflect back on when you didn't have that and how you did feel stuck. And it's like, our realities are always just a reflection of our choices. So it's not anybody else's fault that, you know, you're surrounded by heavy drinkers because you're a heavy drinker and people are like scoffing at not drinking. And that's like the programming you have in your mind is people like completely not never imagining having fun without alcohol or being really judgmental of people trying to better themselves. Like that was the circle of people that I was exposed to. And I'm like, geez, like I remember in the beginning, I was like really hesitant to like put myself out there online and to share my sober curious story and to share because I was surrounding myself with people who were judgmental of people that did that. And so I had this like assumption that everybody was judging me. It's like, no, your, your thinking around life is all based in the people you're surrounding yourself with. So, so powerful to be able to realize that and realize you get to curate your community and reality. And it's only going to reinforce like whatever you're trying to do. You also said um, with the younger generation, really becoming more and more sober curious and, that this is a tidal wave, as you said, yeah. which I think is very accurate. And so what do you think is contributing to this like drastic rise and sober curiosity, especially in the younger generations? Because I know when I was in my 20s, that was the peak of my binge drinking and blacking out and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not in their generation, so I, I don't know. It's sort of I'm observing it from uh, further away. But, you know, I have a lot of, you know, uh, team members at the store and, and, and folks who, uh, you know, work with us who I, I kind of see through, through their eyes as well. And I think, you know, part of what's happening is just this, I would say this sort of democratization of data and socialization um and those are just absurdly big words i should have used some of them. but but i think i think the the things are things are able to spread in a much more honest way at a really grassroots level i think uh you know social media mm-hmm. is doing that um just access to information is doing that but i i think there's like people are coming to the age of first drinking not with the background of oh, this is just what you do. They're coming with some, you know, maybe someone they've seen who's talking about how it's bad for you, who's talking about the health implications right away, who's talking about their own sober curious journey at a younger age. And they're they're really seeing and feeling and hearing those things in a much more honest, direct and consistent way than I think was the case in like my generation. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And, you know, so I think it's, that's really cool to me because I think people are, are literally getting direct access to real honest health information at a peer level in, in ways that I think just hasn't ever happened before. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's fascinating. And it, and it speaks to, I think some of the kind of chipping away at some of the societal constructs around the authorities on health information and, you know, what have you. And, and um, I think, I think that's great. I think that's such a tremendous, powerful thing. And, and it obviously sort of builds on itself, right? So as more of that's happening, more is a bit more information is available and the community builds around it. So that's, that's super interesting. I think there are um, younger folks who are taking a look at, you know, alcohol relative to other things they could be doing. And, 
you know, things like, you know, marijuana, THC, that's become somewhat more prevalent. Like, you know, I do think there's, I, I, I don't, you know, do any of it, but um, I do think people are sort of looking at, you know, alcohol relative to other things that they might, you know, uh, experience and are saying, gosh, on paper, alcohol does not look as good as some of these other choices. And, and there is some, there's some openness to maybe exploring something else if they, if they feel like they, they need something, um, you know, from a substance, which, you know, I, again, I, I think everybody's choice is different. And, and I think that to me, the, whatever version of the healthier choice you are making for yourself is, I mean, that's just, it's sort of obviously better. And, and so, um, I think, I think there are some of those type of elements going on out there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a confluence of a lot of different different data points, which I think gives people the opportunity to look at and say, you know, this isn't just the thing you do. This isn't just the obvious de facto in every situation um, is to, is to pick up a drink. There's there's more choice. There's more options yeah. Um, yeah. out there. Right. I, yes, totally. It's not this blind adherence to societal norms and programming. It's really this measuring of societal norms and programming against our own intuition. And I know that it gets like into the woo woo realm when I say like, I really do feel like this era is an age of like awakening and looking at like you said, the health agencies and the information they're promoting and research and who's researching this. And people are really taking a much more active role in digesting the information we're being fed as opposed to just, okay, so the uh, NIH said that uh, one glass or whatever, you know, the rules are like realizing, okay, these are agencies yeah, that are putting out yeah. health information, but it doesn't mean that um, we don't have to evaluate it or see how it resonates for us as individuals. And just really realizing, too, on like a health level that the health of our country and what is normalized is really nothing to strive for. And so I feel like people are really starting to be like, wait, if I actually want to be healthy, I think I have to do things like differently than right. most people, right. not the same. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I think you got exactly yeah. right, and, and definitely the way I look at it. And you know, I think the the interesting thing is that now this this playbook has been kind of run before on other issues too, right? And so, alcohol's, in my view, it's a long time coming. But you know, sugar is another topic, or uh, smoking is one I always uh, allude to, and and. I love, you know, people don't like to stare in the face, but I always love to use the analogy of um, flying on an airplane. Um, So think about sitting there in the year 1970 um, and you're on an airplane and uh, you're at 7 a.m. and you're in first class and um, the cabin's filled with smoke. Everybody's smoking and everybody's having a drink, you know, Uh, everybody's dressed in a suit probably too. So there's, you know, different things that happen, but you know, you think about smoking and the distance it's come is that in that same scenario today, if you lit up a cigarette, like you'd be arrested for a federal crime. <laughs> I mean, and, and so, uh, and yet still you're, you're offered that same drink you would have been uh, that many years ago. And so um, I do think there, there are differences, but I do think that, you know, there has been a playbook for the kind of impactful, big societal change that can come from an understanding of, you know, more honest health data and, and just, just, I mean, honestly, just the combination of lots of individuals making, you know, an alternative choice that sort of builds to that becoming the norm versus the, the current status quo. Yeah. And just starting to think for themselves more and evaluate. Yeah. It's funny. You said that it's like people smoking on a plane, they are probably doctors too, yeah. smoking, oh, yeah. smoking cigarettes and drinking. Yeah. And- yeah. It reminds me of a quote that says, like, just because everyone's doing it doesn't make it any less crazy. And I feel like that's really something that's coming to the surface in this generation and time is like, just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean it's like the best choice, doesn't mean that it's going to be your best choice. And really applying that level of discernment to our choices and, and kind of separating ourselves. I was just talking about the process of individuation on Mm. my Instagram and 
that idea that like in order to really achieve like our soul's purpose and fulfillment, we actually have to like step away from our societal conditioning and programming and like everyone else to be like, wait, who am I like aside from all of this? And it is like once you start really digging in, it's a little disturbing that I mean, do we really think we've like thought alcohol is healthy in any capacity at all ever? And kind of evaluating like what is the incentive of this promotion of alcohol in moderation? Mm. And you know, some I am a tinfoil hat at heart tinfoil hat wear at heart. So I just do feel like it is a very easy way to keep um, people complacent and controlled and to normalize that like we all have lives that are stressful that we need to like drink because of and it just permits us from ever really achieving our fullest potential. But that's a talk for another day. I wanted to though ask, speaking of our full potential, sure. Um, what benefits you noticed like going alcohol free in mind, body and spirit, since we're kind of on this holistic jaunt. So, so what, what, uh Oh, yeah, um, well, I think again, to me, it was such a profound choice. It, it, it affects every aspect of your life when you kind of really, you know, when you really kind of dig in and think about it. Um, I think from a, from a physicality standpoint, I mean, I think it, it's kind of like your body, st- you know, standpoint. I, it just, it, it's so, so rapid. I mean, you know, to me, it's like, that's why I think periods like dry January or what have you, or, or even shorter breaks for people are so great. Cause I think it's, it's, it's one of the things you can really see a pretty significant turnaround, whether that's, you, you know, just your ability to manage weight, your ability, you know, digestion, your, um, just energy levels, sleep quality. Um, I'm somebody who I'm a big proponent of whoop. Um, I'm a, I'm a big whoop user and, um, you know, seeing whoop data around alcohol use and sleep and recovery is, it's just, it's amazing. I think, I think it's like the, literally the single biggest factor of like anything you could possibly do that, uh, one way or the other that affects like your sleep quality and stuff like that. And so I think just even relatively short periods, I think you almost get the physical, like, so fast that it's kind of something really nice to hang on to, I think. Um, and that's continued yeah. for me. I'm somebody who's always been up and down in weight. And um, I've had, you know, I have like a thyroid issue and stuff that I've managed for my entire life. And, you know, all that stuff was, is, is always a battle, but like, it's way less of a battle, you know, when you versus, you know, trying to do that in the midst of, you know, throwing alcohol on top of it. Um, Oh, and so yeah. I think the physical, physical is super quick to me and, and has been really lasting and, and tremendous. Um, and then, you know, I think the mental side of it, um, which I guess I'll separate mental and spiritual, but then, I mean, the mental side of it. So I, you know, I've also battled a lot of, you know, anxiety and depression and some traumatic stuff, you know, from, from younger. And so I have the whole constellation of pretty difficult mental health stuff to, to wrestle with. And, and obviously that, you know, is, is always a cause of probably, you know, consuming alcohol in the first place and and maybe too much. And, and then, um, but you know, I probably like lots of people got it totally backwards in the sense of thinking, well, well, that's helping solve it, or that's muting some of those, you know, feelings or or the issues I I wrestled with. And, And the reality is it's, it's magnifying them so much greater. I mean, you might have temporary relief for that, but it snaps back so much worse. And and so I think over time, my ability to just sort of, you know, manage, you know, things like anxiety uh, have just been way better. And, and it, it does, it's not that it's not work. I mean, that's the interesting thing is like, I still, I still do a ton of therapy work. Um, but it's allowed me to kind of mm. concentrate on those kind of clear minded, you know, processes, clear minded tools to manage anxiety versus just picking something up. Right. It's like, you, you really have to do all that work. Um, but you're able to do it with clarity of mind and purpose and, and, and what have you and, and see real, you can actually feel yourself so much better in sort of mind and body responding to that work you're doing versus having this sort of like numb, you know, numb sense of life. Um, and then, yeah, I think spirituality all connects to old as well. I, I think that I, you know, probably the biggest 
spiritual thing without, without the, you know, five hour answer that I probably could give you is just, you know, I think the idea of, you know, connectedness, um, you know, comes out so much in, in, you know, sobriety and that type of work, but it, but it, it, it becomes a much more tangible thing day to day. The connectedness I had with my kids and, you know, my wife and my ability to just kind of like have that connected sense of almost anyone I interact with is just so much heightened, more heightened. And, you know, again, I think that's one where people get the sort of alcohol side of it so wrong is that you, you, you think you're picking up that drink in a social situation or a work situation or whatever, you know, or a dating situation or whatever it might be. And you think that that's aiding your connection, right? Cause everybody's mm-hmm. doing it together and everybody's inhibitions are loosened and um, it's all just, you know, kind of a falsehood, right? It's, it's, it's a, that is not the version of yourself you really want to connect with other people on. And, and it's, it's not the sort of honest, deep connection, you know, that's going to last in any way. So I, I think that the ability to kind of have those personal connections in such a more profound and clear minded way has been, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use that as a shortcut to say my spiritual path is, is definitely, um, you know, dramatically improved, you know, through, through quitting drinking. So. Yeah, definitely. You touched upon two of the biggest, I think, misconceptions around drinking. And one is that it helps us to deal with, uh, mental discomfort which maybe it does numb it but it's actually i always use the analogy of like brushing it under the rug and there's eventually this big pile of shit we have to deal with at some point if we ever want to have like the happiest life possible and so it's kind of procrastinating through anesthetization and so yes you're not feeling anything but I also love Brene Brown's quote that says, mm. like, when you numb the dark, you numb the light. And I think that's so true, too, is that we use alcohol to escape uncomfortable feelings, but it can also numb out positive feelings and just through its effects on dopamine, even the way that it yeah. reduces our ability to experience joy in our day to day and raises that threshold for dopamine kind of activation and Yeah. And then the spiritual element is so good too. I had a guest on recently and they were saying, I really love, they said, you know, it's become so normal to connect through disconnecting. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm, I feel like mm -hmm. that's so true. It's like, we look to alcohol as this like connector, but it's like, we're all just simultaneously checking out and removing ourselves from our most, most authentic version in order to like relate to other people and And I mean, I worked in hospitality for years before to pay my way through grad school and to before moving on to work in the health and wellness realm. And there's so much drinking and commiseration and like shift drinks together. I don't talk to like 90% of the people I worked with and got drunk with every night after work that you think you're like so bonded with and you're connecting so much with and I don't talk to half of them anymore, more than half, the majority of them. And it's like, we just like to have that company to like do it with, but how much are you really connecting on a human level with someone when you're simultaneously checking out and numbing out? Yeah. So absolutely. Oh, it's, it's a lot of lies around alcohol that we tell ourselves, And when you step back from it, you can see it so clearly. And it's like, wow, you really do see why so many people are compelled to share because it's like, oh my God, I was doing this forever. I thought this is what alcohol yeah. was doing for me, but it's really not. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask too, as I can hear already rousing in the background, I should probably go <laughs> to that baby um, and see if he needs to go to bed soon. But I wanted to ask a couple more questions before we go. One is which one of is um, this idea of like, I always think of how much we learn through our sober journey and like, what would you really wish that you could tell like pre sober Pat drinking Pat? Like, what would you want him to know about sobriety that would have really helped you to know at the time? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously there's, you know, a lot of what we just talked about, even just giving a sense of like the ways your life can improve, like the dramatic 
ways your life can improve that you don't even think about. I mean, I think even just, just a hint of that, I think would be helpful to have when you're starting out. But I do think, I do think there's some honest messaging to people that's like, it, it is, it is work and it is long work. I mean, it's, it's not, I, I, you know, I, we talked about all the benefits of quitting drinking and things like that, but I often think that people think it's like, well, I, you know, I stopped drinking for dry January and great. My life's going to dramatically improve, you know, leave aside the fact that a large number go back to drinking the next month and don't necessarily see any permanent benefit from yeah. it, but it's, it's not that it's, it's, you can do that and you can keep going and then you've got other work to do and will sort of reveal itself, you know, in your life. And and so it's not kind of this like singular answer is, you know, making a decision to drink or not. I mean, you've got, you know, whatever, whatever level of alcohol consumption you're at, you've got background issues in your life going on. And, you know, even if you're, if you're muting them for a period of time, you know, that work doesn't go away there. It's still all there. And so I think, I think there can be a little bit of a, a sense that, well, there's, there is this singular issue around alcohol consumption. And if I, you know, if I can solve that, you know, it all falls into place. And I think it's like, you know, that's uh, an enabler of it all falling into place, but there's a hell of a lot more to do once you, right. once you do that in terms of deep, you know, personal work that kind of gets you to that, that improved end state. Yeah, absolutely. Is the idea like that you have to address the root causes in order for sobriety to be sustainable. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people, you know, remove alcohol for like a dry month. They're like, oh, I feel better, but like this would never be sustainable because like I'm I'm a stressed out mom or I hate my job right. or right. I actually really don't like my husband when I don't drink yeah. or yeah. I don't have any community or I don't actually take physically good care of myself and I feel like shit constantly, which perpetuates right. the cycle of drinking or I have no healthy coping mechanisms. Like all of these things are root causes as to why we drink. The drinking is like the right. symptom. And so right. when we're not looking at all those, like of course sobriety is going not to feel sustainable. And I think too, you know, a lot of people know that there's a lot of inner work that needs to be done should they remove alcohol yeah. and it's scary and overwhelming and so yeah. sometimes just keeping the band-aid on is the most like that people can deal with at whatever part of their path they're on and that makes a lot of sense my mom always talks to me about or has shared with me in the past about how she's like yeah I wouldn't have dated like half of my boyfriends when I was drinking, sure. if I wasn't, and I kind of knew, like, if I stop drinking, I'm going to need to break up with right. you. So. Right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so it is, yeah, it's just lifting up that rug and pulling out all the shit you've swept under there for years and dealing with it. And then the really liberating part, though, is that you realize what you're capable of and that you've actually dealt with these things once and for all, and you don't have to rely on something to escape it outside of yourself which is so powerful to get to that realization and it really does make all the inner work worth it and I found for me it also gave me this appreciation for discomfort and the fact that like things are actually resolved when you move through discomfort and that dis discomfort is a sign that you're growing um I was very comfortable drinking every day to ignore uncomfortable feelings, but I wasn't happy. You know, I wasn't um, growing and I wasn't challenging myself to like look inward and see like why I felt the need to do something every day that was dulling me down and like preventing Perfect. me from having like the best human experience I could have. So yeah, so much wisdom that you're sharing yeah. with us. I appreciate it, Pat. And I guess lastly, um, just if you have like any words of wisdom for anybody who's like evaluating their relationship with alcohol or maybe even what you were saying earlier, like a traditional recovery a path doesn't resonate for them, you know, like what are your words of wisdom to pass along? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just, uh, it's some version of, you know, have having hope, having tenacity, having, having the sense that, 
um, there is something for you if you want it, right? There, there's a there's a path that's going to work for you, and, and maybe multiple paths, maybe multiple tools. Um, but there's not one way. There's not there's not one way people, you know, choose to have any sober curiosity to go entirely sober. There's there's a lot of different paths and a lot of different resources that can kind of come to bear in that. And I think that the most important thing I think is the personal desire and just like if you feel like it's something you want to change you know know that you can find that change out there that it it Mm -hmm. is very much possible and it's just an exploration of finding the 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 one or ten things that work for you and 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 importantly the people who are going to surround you and, and make that work I mean it's gonna there might be some looking but they're they're around and I think obviously whether it's Dre or it's you know this podcast or other great resources out there it's like there's luckily there's more people shouting out that there are there are paths out here for you and so i think it's just you know if you want it keep turning over rocks until you you find what you're looking for yeah right you don't have to settle for what's right in front of your face or what you're being spoon fed honestly that shit's for the birds anyways Absolutely. Looking harder, you find the better things, I feel, sometimes and the routes to, like, truly living the life that you want. And I think happiness is something that we have to really actively work for. It's not going to fall into our laps. And so really acknowledging that. And I love what you said about honesty regarding the fact that it is work and that it's not just this, like, quick fix that we're so often sold through alcohol, but it's like deep fulfilling and lasting change that we're after. And it's, it is work, but it's the best kind of work. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And the last thing I wanted to do is just have you share like where people can find you on social media and in person at Dragon. Yeah, so we're um, we're at at Dre Drinks on all social media, um, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, you name it. Um, which is we announce everything that way. It's a great community of people to check out. Um, we have our website, which ha- probably right now the most important thing is our calendar of various events. So uh, whether it's tastings or health and wellness events or community based things, um, we've got a bunch of free stuff, a bunch of ticket events. So you can find stuff there. And, you know, our, our mothership currently is a retail store in the south end of Boston. We're at 18, that's 18 Union Park Street. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we hope to have more of them. So we're hoping to sort of expand our community. And, and we're always looking for great people to help with that. So um, yeah. if you're interested, you can always email us um, at, uh, at the address on our website. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening and thanks Pat for sure for pioneering the NA movement in Boston, the biggest drinking city of them all. (laughs) And yeah, so uh, we'll all be checking out Dre and thanks for coming on. Bye everyone. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.